Okay, this is video lecture number 34, the Jacksonian presidency. We've got a few different sections we are covering today. The first is Jackson's agenda. Then we're going to look at the tariff and South Carolina's nullification. Then the bank war followed by Indian removal. And finally, the Jacksonian impact. Now, the election of 1828 amounted to an endorsement of the rising majesty of the people. And Andrew Jackson entered the White House determined to reverse what he saw as a dangerous alliance of federal government power with the forces of special privilege. An advocate of limited government, he sought to block enactment of Henry Clay's American system and to dismantle those elements of it, meaning the protected tariffs the, and the Bank of the United States. Uh, Yet, in order to achieve his goals, uh, he had to take a traditionally weak office and expand its power. Jackson used his control of federal patronage then to build a strong party organization that was loyal to him. He pressed for tariff reduction. Uh, when South Carolina denied the right of the federal government to collect tariffs within the state, uh, he firmly asserted the supremacy of the federal government. Uh, and his right to use military force against a state to enforce all federal law. Above all, Jackson went to war with the Second Bank of the United States, uh, which he and his followers regarded as a grant of extensive public powers uh, to a small, well-heeled band of Eastern capitalists, uh, who in turn used it for their own self-interest rather than the public good. Although his goals were similar to those of Jefferson, uh, he pursued them by means that greatly, and to some dangerously, extended executive power. Uh, he vetoed the proposed rechartering of the Second Bank, uh, and after his triumphant re-election in 1832, uh, he withdrew federal deposits from the bank in defiance of Congress. Jackson also moved to accelerate the removal of the remaining Indian peoples east of the Mississippi to new Indian territories far to the west. In the South, states were seeking to extend their authority over territory held by the so-called five civilized tribes, the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, and Seminole, who insisted instead that they were sovereign peoples. Jackson sided with his white constituents and their insistence on states' rights against even the Cherokee, whose land claims were deemed unquestionable by the Supreme Court. In 1830, he obtained passage of the Indian Removal Act, and he began to use both uh, cajolery and military force to drive Indian tribes westward, a process that culminated after his administration in the famous Trail of Tears. So let's have a closer look then at the Jacksonian presidency. Our first section is Jackson's agenda, rotation and decentralization. To decide policy, Jackson primarily relied on his so-called kitchen cabinet, an informal group of advisors. Using the spoils system, Jackson created a loyal and disciplined national party and dispensed government jobs to aid his friends and win support for his legislative program. Jackson's main priority was to destroy Clay's American system. He rejected national support for transportation projects, uh, which he also opposed on constitutional grounds. And in 1830, he vetoed four internal improvement bills. So let's look at the next section now, the tariff and nullification. Although opposition to the tariff of 1828 helped Jackson to win the election, a major political crisis saddled him with protecting it. To sidetrack the possibility that the government would try to end slavery, South Carolina politicians tried to limit the power of the central government and they chose the tariff as their target. The crisis began in 1832 when high tariff congressmen ignored southern warnings that they were endangering the Union and reenacted the tariff of abominations. In response, the South Carolina State Convention adopted an ordinance of nullification which declared the tariffs of 1828 and 1832 null and void. And then they threatened secession from the Union. South Carolina's act of nullification rested 
on the constitutional arguments developed by Vice President John C. Calhoun, in which he maintained that the Constitution had been ratified by state conventions, and therefore a state convention could declare a congressional law null and void. Jackson denounced this radical redefinition of the constitutional system, uh, and he declared that nullification violated the Constitution, uh, and, then, and, and also threatened the, the very union of the United States. At Jackson's request, Congress passed a force bill authorizing the use of the Army and the Navy to force South Carolina's obedience. At the same time, a tariff act was passed that gradually reduced these rates. By 1842, tariffs reverted to the modest rates of 1816, thereby eliminating another part of Clay's American system. South Carolina rescinded its nullification of the tariff, and Jackson had succeeded uh, in the fact that he established the principle that no state could nullify a law of the United States. Let's move on to the bank war then. By collecting notes and regularly demanding specie, the second bank of the United States kept state banks from issuing too many notes, preventing monetary inflation and higher prices. Most Americans did not understand the regulatory role of the second bank and feared its ability to force bank closures, which left them holding worthless paper. In 1832, Jackson's opponents in Congress persuaded the second bank's president, uh, Nicholas Biddle, to seek an early extension of the bank's charter with the hope of luring Jackson into a veto that would split the Democrats just before the 1832 elections. Jackson vetoed the bank bill and became a public hero. Uh, he declared that the second bank promoted the advancement of the few at the expense of the many. Jackson won the election of 1832 and he jettisoned Calhoun as vice president and instead chose Martin Van Buren. Jackson had Secretary of the Treasury, uh, then Robert B. Taney, uh, withdraw the government's gold from the second bank and deposit it in state uh, pet banks. The bank war escalated into an all-out political battle. Jackson's opponents in the Senate passed a resolution censuring the president for acting independently of Congress although Jackson ultimately won out. When the Second Bank's national charter expired in 1836, Jackson prevented its renewal. Jackson had destroyed both national banking and the American system of protective tariffs and internal improvements. The result was a profound reduction in the purview and powers of the national government. So let's move on then to the next section, which is... Indian removal. In the late 1820s, whites in both the West and East called for the resettlement of the Indians west of the Mississippi River. Indian peoples still controlled vast tracts of ancestral land and were determined to retain them. Setting Indian preferences aside, the Georgia legislature demanded a fulfillment of the promise to extinguish Indian land holdings in the state in return for its 1802 seeding of Western land claims. Jackson gave full support to Georgia. He declared states were sovereign within their borders, and he withdrew the federal troops that had protected Indian enclaves. Jackson then pushed through Congress the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which provided territory in modern-day Oklahoma and Kansas to Native Americans who would give up their ancestral holdings on the promise that they could live on the new lands in perpetuity. When Chief Black Hawk and his followers refused to move from their rich farmland in western Illinois, Jackson sent troops to expel them, which resulted in the army pursuing him to the Wisconsin Territory and engaging in the brutal eight-hour Bad Axe Massacre of 1832. Over the next five years, American diplomatic pressure and military power forced 70 Indian nations to sign treaties and move west of the Mississippi. In 
In Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, the Supreme Court denied Indian independence. However, in Worcester versus Georgia, the Supreme Court voided Georgia's extension of state law over the Indians. Rather than guaranteeing the Cherokees' territory, the U.S. government took it from them. When a vast majority of Cherokees had not departed to the new territory by the uh, deadline of May of 1838, President Martin Van Buren ordered General uh, Winfield Scott to forcibly march them 1,200 miles to a new Indian territory. And this is a journey that's remembered as the Trail of Tears. Though Seminoles were the exception, the national government had forced the removal of most eastern Indian peoples to the west. All right, and our last section then is the Jacksonian impact. Jackson permanently expanded the authority of the nation's chief executive using the rhetoric of popular sovereignty to declare that the president is the direct representative of the American people. Appointed Chief Justice by Jackson, Robert B. Taney persuaded the court to give constitutional legitimacy to Jackson's policies of anti-monopoly and states' rights. In Charles River Bridge Company versus Warren Bridge Company in 1837, Taney's ruling undermined the legal positions of chartered corporations and encouraged competitive enterprise, uh, thus challenging John Marshall's interpretation of the contract clause in Dartmouth College versus Woodward, uh, which had emphasized the binding nature of public charters. In 1837, Taney's decisions enhanced the regulatory role of state governments, uh, mayor of New York versus Milne, uh, and restored some of the state's economic powers, uh, Briscoe versus Bank of Kentucky. Most states mounted a constitutional revolution, extending the vote to all white men, reapportioning legislatures on the basis of population, and mandating the election of officials. Most Jacksonian era constitutions uh, prohibited states from granting exclusive charters to corporations or extending loans to, and credit guarantees to private businesses uh, and protected taxpayers also uh, by setting strict limits on state debts uh, and encouraging judges to enforce them. Uh, Jackson populists embraced a small government outlook then. Uh, based on classical liberalism, or laissez-faire, uh, in public at least. Uh, they attacked government-granted special privileges and celebrated the power of ordinary people. Okay, this does conclude, then, uh, th this video lecture for today. Um, please address the review questions at the bottom of the screen and continue on with your work.